My name is Ariel Gordon, and I am the Promotions and Publicity Coordinator for U of M Press. Um, you've joined us for the launch of Rhonda Hintner and Jim Machorek's anthology, Civilian Internment in Canada, Histories and, and Legacies. Now tonight, editors will be joined by contributors Art Mickey, um, Mike Bjorge, I'm sorry, I had to look up my pronunciation, Todd Casey, uh, Franca Yakoveta, and Cassandra Luciak. Um, so I am going to introduce the editors there, and then they're going to take it away. And I'm going to come back and introduce each of the speakers. And then at the end, we'll have a Q&A. So I think it will be quite wonderful. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to, to celebrating this book and to hearing it, um, hearing the editors talk about it, the editors and the contributors. So here goes. Rhonda L. Hintzner is a professor of history at Brandon University and an active public historian. Prior to joining BU, Hintzner joined, Hintzner served as director of research and curation at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, and before that, as curator of Western Canadian history at the Canadian Museum of History. Her most recent book, a 2019 Wilson Prize finalist, is entitled Pierogies and Politics, Canada's Ukrainian Left, 1891 to 1991, which came out in 2018. Jim Machorek has taught at the University of North Dakota since 1993. His books include The People's Co-op, The Life and Times of a North End Institution, which came out in 2000, and Formidable Heritage, Manitoba's North and the Cost of Development, 1870 to 1930, which came out in 2004. Originally from Winnipeg, Jim is currently working on a book length study concerning the social and economic history of Winnipeg and its many real and imagined communities in the interwar period. Please welcome to the stage, Rhonda and Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, many thanks to all of you who are joining us tonight. Uh, once again, this is not the book launch we were envisioning for civilian internment in Canada, but here we are. And we're glad that we could all come together to celebrate this important project. I'll give you a bit of background on how it came about. This collection grew out of an international workshop held at the Ukrainian Labour Temple in Winnipeg, Manitoba from June 17th to the 19th, 2015. And the purpose of this meeting was simple gather together community members, scholars, activists, public history professionals, uh, students, educators, artists, and others with an interest in or experience of internment, most notably former internees, their descendants, and redress activists. And we wanted to engage them in a dialogue on the history and continued impact of civilian internment in Canada from 1914 to the present. By bringing together this diverse group, this diverse array of discussants, the resulting conversation was by design explicitly cross-cultural or perhaps more accurately cross internment. One of the most notable features of the workshop, especially in the sessions devoted to survivor and legacy memories was how often similarities and some notable differences in the camp experiences or family experiences of loss and betrayal associated with internment really cut across ethnic, religious and political lines. Indeed, this became a key theme that emerged from the workshop. So many participants, survivors, and scholars associated with the study of one particular group proclaiming, I didn't know that happened to your people too. We're immensely, immensely grateful to those who attended and shared their stories and their, their research at the workshop. And we really wish all of it could have been included in this book. These conversations were both necessary and timely for a number of reasons. To begin with, we knew all too well that many of the former internees and other eyewitnesses were passing from the scene and that it was imperative that their stories be preserved before it was too late. And just as importantly, we were also keenly aware that the legacy of internment with its sad record of violating civil, civil rights and liberties of Canadians and non-Canadians as well, was a matter that has all too often been swept under the proverbial carpet, in spite of its continuation in a variety of forms and its direct relevance to many of the social, cultural, and political issues with which we grapple today. The workshop was organized by the Canadian Society for Ukrainian Labour Research in collaboration with a number of community organizations, including the Manitoba Japanese Canadian Cultural Centre and staff from the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. 
It was made possible thanks to generous financial and in-kind contributions from a number of organizations. And these include Brandon University, the Manitoba Japanese Canadian Cultural Center, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, the Association of United Ukrainian Canadians, the Yvonne Franco Museum, the Joseph Zukin Memorial Foundation, the Endowment Council of the Canadian First World War Internment Recognition Fund, the University of North Dakota, the Manitoba Government Ethnocultural Support Program, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, Brandon University Student Union, Past Perfect Productions, and the Canadian Museum of History, along with Carleton University's Public History Program and University of Manitoba Press, of course. We appreciate the commitment and patience each of the authors in this collection demonstrated throughout the editorial and publication process. <clears throat> Others helped move this book along too, and several deserve singling out for their particular contributions. Connie Humes provided diligent assistance with many aspects of the manuscript in the early phases of its development. Lily Stearns and Brett Stearns, who were key organizers of the internment workshop, remained passionate supporters of the book project. And not enough good can be said of the folks at University of Manitoba Press, including David Carr, Jill McConkey, David Larson, Glenn Bergen, uh, and copy editor extraordinaire Gretchen Albers. And of course, thanks to Mike Carroll for the fabulous cover design. It truly is a beautiful book. And of course, we can't, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Ariel Gordon for organizing this event tonight. And we're so grateful for everything she's done to make it happen. She is an organizing machine and uh, just incredible for wrangling all of us and making sure that everything uh, goes smoothly tonight. So we really appreciate all she's done. Uh, we have some other thanks that I'm gonna make on behalf of me and Jim. Uh, to those closest to us, we owe an immense debt of gratitude. I'd like to acknowledge my family, especially my partner, Aaron Floresco, my delightful eight-year-old son, Sebastian Hinther Floresco, my mom, Evelyn Hinther, Glenn Ash, Lunana Freychuk, Helen Floresco, George Floresco, Kathy Kennedy, and my very recently departed Nana, Sophie Sconley, for their support. Many friends also graciously supported this project too, including Wendy Sawatsky and Erica Abbott, along with numerous others. And they really helped sustain me as they always have through these often hilly book manuscript journeys. I'd also like to thank my many wonderful colleagues at Brandon University for their ongoing interest in and support of the project. Um, on Jim's behalf, I will thank uh, the support, uh, thank his family for their support. Um, and he'd like to acknowledge especially Mary Machorek, who has now helped him to survive through a PhD and four book manuscripts. Um, uh, his mother, Sheila Machorek, and his children, Caitlin, Brendan, and Colleen, along with the newest additions to the family, Haley and Braylin Machorek. And they've all made the writing process and editing process far more enjoying, enjoyable and meaningful for him. Jim also wants me to thank his colleagues at the University of North Dakota for their unflagging support, encouragement, and patience. And he also owes a very real debt of gratitude to the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of North Dakota and its scholarship initiative grants and to the Schulte family whose generosity to the history department at UND provides the sort of financial support that allows him to keep engaged in primary research. I'm gonna turn things over to Jim now to say a bit more about the book, its various components, and what we tried to achieve through the editorial process. Thank you, Rhonda. <clears throat> um, I first of all wanna echo all of the acknowledgements that, uh, that Rhonda just mentioned. <laughs> It truly does take a village to bring a project like this to, to fruition. Um, now, as Rhonda pointed out, this book came out of the workshop that we hosted at the Ukrainian Labor Temple in 2015. And I think one of the things that needs to be stressed is that when we began thinking about this project, we were struck by how the various episodes of civilian internment that had occurred in Canada from the beginning of the First World War, right up to, well, pretty much up to yesterday, uh, were all treated as completely separate incidents. And yet we knew that, that there were sorts, all sorts of threads that bound them together, these different experiences, most notably the ways in which governmental claims of doing things in the interest of national security could be used to attack those who were outside of the mainstream, be it in racial, ethnic, religious, or ideological terms. And so we very consciously made a decision to, so that we could be more inclusive, to actually expand the meaning or the definition of internment beyond a simple dictionary 
definition, which we did provide, but we went, wanted to go beyond that. Now the workshop turned out to be, I think really quite a remarkable gathering. And one of the things that really struck both Rhonda and myself were the different recollections that survivors had. And also how, depending on how young they were when, when they were interned or when they were first aware or impacted by internment, how different their experiences were and how different their memories were. And this brought to mind the malleability of memory, the impact of intergenerational trauma, and also the politics of commemoration. These were all matters that came to the fore at the workshop and made it into the book and some allied publications in one way or other. Now, we ended the workshop, and here I'm gonna get sort of down to the nitty gritty of the formation of the book. Um, at the end of the workshop, we asked attendees to submit versions of their presentations. And then we began the sometimes arduous tasks of selection, also recruitment of attendees who were reluctant to submit pieces because not everyone was an academic and did not automatically think that they should be submitting their pieces. Um, and then of course, the editorial work itself. Slowly, probably too slowly, but very surely the book that you have seen before you tonight began to take shape. Now, as editors, Rhonda and I made a very conscious decision that we wanted to avoid lumping the chapters together simply by internment episode. And we opted instead for a more thematic and comparative approach. So those of you who have a copy of the book in front of you, uh, will see that part one is a set of broad-based meta-narratives that seek to provide readers with a context for what's gonna fall in the rest of the collection. And this features chapters by museum curator, Jody Giesbrecht and lawyer, Dennis Edney. They're vastly, vastly different in, in their focus points, but these chapters are united in their common concern for placing individual episodes of internment and the suspension of civil liberties into a much broader context. Commencing with the First World War, and in the case of Dennis Edney, who was the pro bono lawyer for, uh, for Omar Khadr, uh, to very, very recently. Part two, with chapters by Cassandra Luciak, who will be speaking later on, and myself, provides some new insights into the nature and, I think, surprising impact of internment operations on the founding and operation of left-wing Ukrainian institutions, both during and between the two world wars. Cassandra, as I said, is gonna be joining us tonight. And I think she'll have much more to say on the topic. The chapters in part three explore the important ways that grassroots actors and their engagement with authorities impacted the internment experiences of two quite diverse communities. Marinelle Mandrell examines the case of Serbians during the Great War, while Travis Tomchuk considers Montreal Italians during the Second World War. In part four, chapters by Rhonda, and Christine Whitehouse examined internment through a gender lens in the context of two quite divergent internment experiences. Christine Whitehouse's uh, chapter focuses on the German Jewish camp boys, as they were referred to, who were interned in Canada at the behest of the British government. While Rhonda's focuses on left-wing women who were arrested, jailed, and in a handful of cases, formally or nearly interned. In part five, uh, Aya Fujara and uh, Michael Borgi Mikhail, <laughs> uh, offer provocative chapters on Japanese Canadians during the Second World War, both of which challenge some very long-standing interpretations of the Japanese Canadian experience and behavior during internment. Mike, who's joining us tonight, will have, I think, much more to say on this. Part six is the most eclectic and personal set of chapters in the collection. Grace Thompson, shares personal recollections of the experience of, of forced relocation and internment, but she also weaves her mother's experience into the narrative via the medium of her mother's handwritten memoir that Thompson translated from the original Japanese and brings into this essay. Clement Schulte's chapter is a careful reconstruction of the experience of her German political refugee father who had lived and worked in England prior to the outbreak of the Second World War and who was subsequently interned in Britain and then Canada. And it's also about the role that this incident played in family history. Myra Mumerick's essay rounds out that section by examining the experience of both Peter and Mary Prokop following Peter's arrest and internment. Peter was a, a fairly important leader of the Ukrainian left in 1940 and for many years thereafter. Part seven 
explicitly examines questions of commemoration and the politics of public memory when it comes to negative heritage. Chapters by Ed and Todd Cassie, Emily Kudgy and Kathleen Ogilvy, and Sharon Riley thoughtfully examine the issues confronting museums seeking to educate a broader public on issues that don't really fit into that great heroic tradition of national or regional history commemoration. And Todd is joining us tonight and we'll speak to this point. Part eight, with chapters by Paula Draper and Judith Kessler, examined two distinct groups of international internees whom Canada hosted uh, in the context of the Second World War. Paula Draper examines the German Jewish camp boys who were refugees from Nazi terror who'd sought sanctuary in Britain, but were then interned as enemy aliens on account of nationality, and then later shipped to Canada for ongoing incarceration, and in many cases, very, very unhappily. Meanwhile, Judith Kessler's chapter brings to light the hitherto largely unexamined case of Second World War German merchant seamen, these internees and their experiences in Canada. And she offers some very surprising insights on the process of memory among these young men. Finally, the chapters in the book's last section speak to the complexity and challenges of redress, of popular memory, and what it means to understand, acknowledge, and attempt to rectify past injustices in light of complicated shared pasts and presents. Both of these authors, Art Mickey and Franca Yacoveta, are joining us tonight, so I'll leave it to them to talk about their own chapters. At the end of the day, Rhonda and I hope that the book is a useful bringing together of the various civilian internment experiences in Canada and the very, very closely allied question of the suspension of civil liberties and civil rights in times of crisis and perceived crisis, questions that we think are still of crucial importance today. So I've said enough. At this point, I'd like to turn things, well, Ariel will probably want to introduce them, but it's gonna to go to Art Mickey next. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, just before I introduce Art Mickey, um, I forgot to do our land acknowledgement. Um, now I know from the chat and all the comments you've made that we have had, we have people from all over North America um, and probably further afield with us right now, but U of M Press um, and my house where I'm broadcasting from are in Winnipeg. Um, and so we want to do a land acknowledgement for that place. Um, if any of the panelists want to do a land acknowledgement from where they are, then that's, they're welcome to do that too, but this is ours. University of Manitoba Press is located on the original lands of the Anish Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. U of M Press respects the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. All right, so Art Mickey, I'm gonna read you his, his biography and then he'll join us. So here goes. Arthur K. Mickey, C-M-O-M, -M, has had a distinguished career as an elementary school teacher, principal and community activist. As president of the National Association of Japanese Canadians, NAJC from 1984 to 1992, he led the negotiations to, to achieve a just redress settlement in 1988 for Japanese Canadians interned during the Second World War. In 1991, he received the Order of Canada. So Art, can you join us? Hello. Thanks. Art, you just have to turn your audio on. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here this evening to join Rhonda and James on the release of the book, uh, Civilian Interment in Canada. Uh, I just wanted to uh, reflect a little bit on how I got involved. Uh, it was Rhonda who invited me because I had spoken to her class about the Japanese Canadian redress and internment uh, uh, several times actually. And when she told me about this particular conference that she was involved in, 
I, I felt that it, it sort of it fit in well with what we were trying to do as Japanese Canadians, that is to educate people about our experience during the Second World War. And so uh, through that, I was able to uh, give a glimpse into our redress movement, uh, which for me was a real interesting period, of, period in time, uh, negotiating with the government and how difficult it was to, first of all, get the government to first acknowledge that they made a mistake, uh, but it took four years before we were able to come to an agreement. Uh, one of the things that uh, I knew about was the Ukrainian internment, mainly because uh, during the period of our campaign, I met uh, Lubomir Lusiak, who was uh, heading the Ukrainian internment apology. And so over that period of time, I got to know a lot about what happened to Ukrainian. And there's such so many parallels between our experience and the Ukrainian community as well. And so when I heard about this particular conference, I felt that uh, uh, it would be really interesting to learn more about uh, how the War Measures Act impacted upon people, how their civil rights were taken away. And so as a result, uh, I, I was very pleased to see the outcome of the project. Thanks to Rhonda and James for putting it together. Just a little background. Uh, my, my family came uh, from British Columbia during the Second World War. Uh, we were forcibly removed uh, from the Fraser Valley and uh, my grandparents and parents, and I was five years old at the time, uh, they decided to come to Manitoba mainly because they were told that if we came as a family that we could be kept together. Whereas if you were sent to an internment camp in the interior of BC, uh, families are often separated. So that was the motivation for us to come, not realizing how cold Winnipeg and Manitoba was and uh, compared to British Columbia. Uh, and uh, also the difficult conditions that they lived under here. But people made the best of it and resettled uh, here in Manitoba. And now we have a thriving community uh, that's very active uh, in, in uh, Winnipeg. Um, so in that sense, uh, my experience uh, through Redress is, uh, was a real learning one for me, uh, meeting a lot of people across the country, sharing experiences and learning about their hardships. Uh, and uh, so Redress became very meaningful for me in the sense that it was a real wrong that occurred to our community because we, 21,000, Japanese Canadians were removed from the West Coast. That's the entire population uh, on the West Coast uh, at the time, uh, mainly because of our ancestry. Uh, there's been no case of any wrongdoing by any members of our community during that period of time. Although the government said that we were being removed because we were uh, possibly a national security issue, a threat to our country, uh, but, Unfortunately, I think uh, uh, governments look at us and see where we look differently, we're Japanese. Um, and one of the things that uh, it turned out is that they didn't realize that the majority of people who they were removing from the West Coast were basically people either born in Canada, 75% were either born in Canada or were Canadian citizens. And so as a result, uh, the internment um, removed a lot of citizens from uh, depriving them of their civil rights. And so redress became very important. So in essence, uh, we try to capture the process of redress in the chapters that I've written uh, and the difficulties that we encountered and also the successes that we had. And uh, I just wanna remind people that uh, the Japanese redress was the first time that the government uh, ever compensated a group of people, a, a community, uh, and it became a very important precedent uh, because later on there were many cases where groups are being compensated for wrongdoings by the government. So I thank uh, Rhonda and James for inviting me to be part of the book and uh, uh, I found the, all of the information in there so meaningful and interesting and 
and uh, you know, brought tears to my eyes as well. So thank you. Thanks so much, Art. That was wonderful. All right. So next on our list of contributors who are going to speak, we have Mike Bjorge. Um, and he received his doctorate in history from Queen's University. He teaches economic and political history in Toronto, Ontario, and works primarily on the history of capitalism. He has just completed the manuscript for his first book, The Workers' War. Please join me in welcoming Mike Bjorge. <laughs> I'm muted. Oh, I'm no longer muted. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, thanks to Ariel from University of Manitoba Press for organizing this, this get together. And uh, thanks to, of course, Jim and, uh, and Rhonda for editing, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So my chapter in this um, is, uh, is a chapter of my thesis mentioned there, the workers war, um, which is, you know, concerned sort of about strikes and, uh, and, and unrest um, in Canada during World War II. And although most of this is about sort of the, um, you know, the industrial front and, and, and work and labor in Canada, I thought that a really, you know, central part of this story that, that oftentimes wasn't, wasn't so told was about um, strikes and unrest within the Japanese removal operation during World War II. Um, a lot of the um, historiography and rhetoric that surrounded internment made very slight um, or, or very um, sort of parallel arguments about, um, about fighting back against the internment operations and fighting back against the removal operations and then fighting back against the forced labor regimes uh, that people were subject to. And so I went looking, assuming that because Canada, you know, the rest of workers in Canada were all out on wildcat strike every other week, that it would be the same thing in the internment camps and the forced labor camps and the road camps, uh, both in British Columbia, Alberta, and amongst the, the so-called political internees in Ontario. And of course, that's what we found. And so, you know, in this chapter, I try to explain and, and sort of shed some light and also interrogate a little bit how um, strikes and uh, mass removal of labor and, and even in some cases riots amongst people, um, mostly against uh, the British Columbia Security Commission, the RCMP, uh, help people actually you know, make their lives better, um, expand their realms of freedom, even in this sort of extreme instance of unfreedom uh, within Canadian history. Um, so if you're interested in, in um, sort of a mixture of industrial relations and forced labor and, and, uh, and human agency and people fighting back, um, you know, I think it's a, it's, I hope at least it's a, it's a Compton addition to the field. Now, just quickly, you know, I, I think this, uh, this book was a really important addition to Canadian history and Canadian historiography because it really draws, I think, extremely important connections between different things that we often seem as sort of disparate um, or you know atomistic, right? Of these of these different instances in which uh, you know martial law is declared or laws just abrogated or ignored or what what have you, and, and how power sort of works uh, in our society and under sort of our socioeconomic system that we have. Um, so, you know, I think it's I think it's you know drawing all these different um, these different threads together is is uh, really important project, but I also think it was a mammoth project, right? It's huge. We're talking about, you know, a, a massive temporal period, um, different sort of chronological threads, um, different, uh, you know, of course, different authors with different backgrounds and ideas and theories and experiences, all bringing it together in like this very, in some ways, extremely complex collection. Um, so, you know, I think that's an important addition and one that I'm very happy to be a, a part of. So um, I hope you all enjoy it. And, uh, and thank you for listening to my, my, my short blurb about my chapter. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so next up, we've got Todd E. Casey. Um, and so I'm just gonna read his bio and he'll tell you about his chapter. Todd E. Casey is a PhD candidate in art history and cultural heritage and preservation studies at Rutgers University a member of the board of directors of the New Brunswick Internment Camp Museum, and the author of Not Too Old to Serve, Veterans Guard of Canada at the New Brunswick or NB Internment Camp Museum, published by Legion Magazine in May 2018. Todd, can you join us?
Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, I'm coming to you from uh, New Jersey, uh, south of the border, uh, but I am a Canadian myself, and um, I want to thank uh, everyone at University of Manitoba Press and Rhonda and Jim uh, for allowing me to be part of this event and part of the uh, the book. Uh, it was a great experience. Um, the the chapter which I co-authored uh, with my father, Ed Casey, um, is titled The New Brunswick Internment Camp Museum Preserving the History of Internment Camp B-70. And our contribution looks at that camp and an examination of Camp uh, B-70, which is the only, which was the only World War II internment camp in the Maritimes. Um, it was situated in the middle of the Acadia National Forest, about halfway between Fredericton and small coal mining town uh, called Minto. Uh, life in Camp B-70 had all the trappings of prison. There were five rows of barbed wire. There were six um, gun towers um, that encircled the buildings. And the camp itself had two phases. The first phase from 1940 to 1941 housed uh, German and Austrian Jews who fled to England to escape Nazi oppression and then were shipped to Canada. Uh, however, the second phase from 1941 to 1945, uh, they incarcerated Italian and German merchant marines and unfortunately uh, also Canadians uh, who were either viewed as having uh, fascist or uh, Nazi, uh, being fascist or Nazi sympathizers, or were in some way viewed to be a, a deemed a risk to the uh, the war efforts. Um, and then we sort of look at the internment camp museum. Um, the camp uh, itself was the only one in the Maritimes, but uh, the museum, the uh, New Brunswick Internment Camp Museum is actually one of only two museums in Canada devoted exclusively to World War II internment camp. Um, and it's also World War II internment camps. And it's also one of only five in all of North America. Uh, so we feel it's a very important uh, story and an important museum that uh, people need to know about. Um, you know, we explore the heritage preservation efforts of the New Brunswick Internment Camp Museum, uh, which my father founded. Uh, he started the museum and he is currently the director of the museum. Um, and we look at sort of an overview of the objects. We have over 700 uh, items in the camp. Uh, they're all associated with the museum. And, you know, throughout all of this, we are thinking about issues surrounding the curation of negative heritage, uh, which is defined as places that can be interpreted by a group as commemorating conflict or trauma, uh, which we think is, is very important. And in Canada, negative heritage preservation is understudied. And we feel that the story of Camp B-70 can enrich the collective memory of Canadians and can add positively to the sort of the, to enrich the cultural memory, or sorry, the collective memory and positively influence the present as well as the future of Canada by negotiating the difficult heritage of the past. Um, and that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Thank you so much. All right, so next up we have Cassandra Lusiak. Now, Cassandra is, I'm gonna lift my book up, is a PhD candidate in the Department of History at the University of Toronto. She is the author of a forthcoming graphic novel based on the experiences of an internee held in the Capus Casing internment camp from 1914 to 1917. Cassandra, can you join us please? Am I here? Yes, I'm here. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, it's really great to 
virtually see so many of you. It's really exciting. Um, anyways, my article in the collection was really my first attempt at thinking through how internment during the First World War impacted both the individual and collective identities of Ukrainians. There really is a robust historiography on Ukrainian internment, but researchers for a variety of reasons haven't really spent a lot of time fleshing out what I call the personal side of internment. Um, so I was really interested in whether or not internees simply reintegrated into their communities once they were released, or whether they stripped away any associations of their Ukrainianness to become more palatable to Anglo-Canadians, or maybe if internment perhaps radicalized its victims, triggering a migration into progressive outfits who could offer some kind of explanation for their incarceration by connecting it to larger societal problems that are operative in Canada at the time, like Anglo supremacy, settler colonialism, capitalism, and so on. So the article is the outcome of that kind of that thought experiment that I had a few years ago. My ultimate goal with the piece was less about providing some kind of definitive or conclusive answer to these questions, but rather to hopefully influence further scholarship to not only return to internment as a topic, but to also start broadening the way in which we understand it by making bigger picture connections. Um, as I attempted to do between, for example, internment and politics, internment and migrant labor, internment and settler colonial expansion, and the possibilities on this front are, are really endless, right? Because as I argue um, in the piece, internment wasn't just this one-off event or some kind of regretful anomaly. Internment as a phenomenon was actually a manifestation of the normal functioning of the state towards migrant populations. So it's imperative that we start talking about it in that context. Um, my colleagues have already made some great uh, points about the significance of this collection. So I'll just add um, one very quick thing that we haven't talked about yet. Um, so I wrote this piece in 2015 when I was starting my PhD and the book is now out as I'm starting to wrap up the PhD. So it really feels like a full circle moment for me personally, but that also made me think about my own development as a scholar and just how integral both Rhonda and Jim have been to that process um, by allowing me as a junior scholar to not only participate in their conference, which I think was the first conference I participated in, um, but then, then to also let me write something for it. And I think that really speaks to what makes this collection so special in that it created space for graduate students, but it also centers activists, community members, and survivors of internment. And there's something very extraordinary and, and powerful in that. So um, congratulations, Rhonda and Jim. Um, congratulations to the other contributors. And thanks again, everyone, for being here. I'm turning it over now to, to Franca. Yes, who I will introduce. <laughs> All right, uh, Franca Yakoveta is a professor of history at the University of Toronto. Recent publications include Beyond Women's Words, Rutledge 2018, and articles on married women's nationalities and nationality and migrant women, oh, I'm starting over. Recent publications include Beyond Women's Words, Rutledge 2018, and articles on married women's nationality and migrant children's health. She is completing a monograph on women's pluralism and is involved in a collaborative project on Emma Goldman in Toronto, History and Legacy. Oh, that may have been a typo. Anyways, please welcome Franca. Thank you, Ariel. And um, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. I too want to thank Rhonda and Jim for the initial conference and for the book. Uh, I want to thank University of Manitoba Press the co-panelists here tonight, and also uh, say that it's an honor to uh, share this panel uh, with Art Miki, uh, because your role, your leadership role, and the work that you put into uh, redress activism in order to uh, uh, remember, commemorate people who have been mistreated uh, has been so important, and in so many ways, unparalleled. My own essay, um, considers um, a central, but in some ways under-analyzed uh, concept of suffering in the context of Italian-Canadian internment during the Second World War. And I do that in the form of a reply to a woman critic who 
wrote me initially an angry letter that denounced um, the book Enemies Within, which was um, a book that came out of the late 1990s research published in the 2001 that had to do with Italian Canadian internment. And I was part of a group of um, Italian Canadian historians who felt that the, that the redress movement and the official narrative of Italian Canadian internment um, had left a lot out, that it had simplified things. It had not talked about the role of the uh, Mussolini's consular officials and infiltrating organizations. It hadn't talked about the anti-fascists, right, who were who speaking out against fascism. Uh, at, at risk, right? Because in some cases there was, you know, tremendous fear of reprisals against families back home. But my critic, um, who was uh, uh, wrote me a very articulate critique, um, she, in her view, she felt that uh, in trying to kind of walk this fine line between critiquing the official narrative of internment and not condoning um, the state repression itself. She just felt we had failed. And that in, in, in constant referencing to only 600 Italian Canadians being interned, she felt that what we had done was denied the trauma that had been endured by women like her, that had been endured by wives, by daughters, by granddaughters of men who had been unjustly interned. And she said in response to this, she said she, she gave up counting how many times we said only 600 Less, less than 1% and so forth, and said, and accused, you know, accused us and accused me uh, of playing a numbers game in terms of suffering. And she said, you know, how, how, so how do you historians measure suffering now? You know, at what, at what point, you know, can we acknowledge suffering? And she had her own, right, measuring stick, which was, you know, one person unfairly interned uh, uh, was, uh, was something that we ought to have stressed uh, pointing out, for example, right, that none of the internees had been convicted of, uh, of a criminal act. So in trying to respond to her, I try to do a few things. I do try to respond as respectfully as I can. I also try to account for the fact that that first letter was one letter, then there was a second, also very critical, and then the third, where she more or less exonerated me and praised me for my, my treatment of Italian-Canadian internment. Um, and I also talk a little bit about the, the, between the first and the second letters, I did respond to the first letter, then there's a second letter, uh, and then we actually met, not knowing we would be in the same room at a, at a community event where uh, uh, issues around redress and new research and redress had come up. We met, it was a very awkward uh, encounter, um, and I do have regrets about not having had a long conversation with her. Um, and part of the, the article is about uh, talking about that. Um, I also, uh, in, as a way of trying to, re to, to address the issues that she raised and to take them as respectfully, take them up as respectfully as possible, I also made use, use of new oral histories that have been conducted uh, with Italian Canadians, mainly family members, because most of the internees um, are, are, are deceased. Um, it's a project called When Italian Canadians Were Enemy Aliens. Interviews were done, posted on the website and so forth. And so what I did was listen to about a dozen of these um, oral histories in order to think seriously about how people remembered suffering, um, how people commemorated suffering, and in particularly with a focus on women, how, how women talked about uh, the suffering, how, how family members talked about, about the women uh, in the family during the period of internment. Now, I'm not going to go into much detail except to say that there were, you know, were some recurring um, themes. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, we were okay, but there were those starving women and children, you know, that, that you know, were, were so, uh, 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 you know, badly mistreated. And I try to explore that. Um, there's a, a shared kind of presentation of their childhood memories because for these people, uh, internment uh, was a childhood experience and a lot of discussion of how very, very happy childhoods are then punctured, right, and destroyed, right, by the RCMP arrest uh, and internment. Um, another um, kind of theme that I found, and I was also looking for body gestures and looking for recurring refrains and so forth, I also noted that there were kind of three main portraits of women that came up in these oral histories. One was kind of the stoic mother, Right, who uh, you know just held her head high, tried to cope, didn't want to 
because Foss wanted to get through it, wanted to protect the children. Um, there were also stories about what I called heroic uh, mothers uh, who got three jobs, uh, who were negotiating loans when they needed needed it. A woman in Montreal who actually finished building the house that her husband, you know, couldn't finish building because uh, he'd gone off to an internment camp. Um, and and how at some point, right, women like her thought, I am out here doing all of this, and those men are in there eating and playing sports. And there was even some gender tension in terms of in terms of that. Um, and then there was also the more kind of conventional notion of the supported mother, you know, different family members supporting the mother with the, with the irony of uh, sons who were doing military service, right, uh, providing some of the funds for doing that. Another aspect is also to, to, to remember too that um, the concern with suffering um, ought also to extend to the anti-fascists, to the Italian anti-fascists, both liberals and radicals who did speak out um, and, and who were um, uh, um, you know, criticized for it, um, and who with someone like uh, Attilio Bortolotti uh, was um, going to be deported back to Italy where probably he would have suffered right from, uh, from death at the hands of, uh, of um, uh, Mussolini. Um, and who, as some of you know, was, was a, the last political cause that Emma Goldman was involved in uh, before her death in 1940, which was preventing the deportation of Attilio uh, Bortolotti. So I was also asked to say a few words about the book as a whole and the historiography. Um, and I think we've heard people speak very eloquently to the contributions of the book. So to make my little segment even more brief, I'm gonna shift from the tea that I've been sipping from my Lauren Harris group of seven mug um, to a glass of wine so that we could uh, have um, a formal celebration of the book. People have talked about why the book is important. The conference really was a remarkable event. The first time where I think we brought together, as people have said, right, uh, uh, scholars, academics, activists, uh, survivors from the different communities that had uh, experienced internment. The intergenerational lineup was, was tremendous. I mean, I was thrilled seeing younger scholars uh, uh, writing, write, writing new um, articles, um, the, um, the range of, of contributors who were there, uh, the issue from research to, um, to museums and public history and how do we present this. Um, also, I think, you know, greater, both greater range and greater depth. I think there's more in the book now that uh, continues the early interest in the social history, also of internment, women's history of internment, the gender history of internment, and there's uh, uh, work, you know, on uh, both the, the really important early work that Paula Draper did on the camp boys, and I believe Paula, Paula is here, so a shout out to her, and also the new work of Christine Whitehouse looking at issues around privacy and the sexual self. Um, I, th I think there's tremendously, you know, important new work on Right, comrades in love and in struggle who were separated by internment that's here. Um, and um, the, the, and it, it's, it's, again, people have said it, so I'll just say that it's also both an historical book and a contemporary book and a very, very timely, very timely book. So I'm gonna take my glass of wine and um, say congratulations for putting together an important collection. Thanks so much, Branka. All right, now we're going to have a Q&A next, but um, we have, as uh, Franca mentioned, we have an actual, a few other contributors here in attendance tonight. So I'm gonna get Jim and Rhonda to come back up and to welcome them to speak. They won't, you won't see them on camera, but you will be able to hear them. Hello, hello. And I believe that it's uh, that it's Clements uh, who is who is waiting to come online. Can we arrange that, Ariel? Clements, you just need to uh, unmute yourself. Yes. There we go. Oh, there. Ah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> right. Well, I'd like to say warm thanks to all those involved in organizing the conference, which was a, a truly memorable occasion 
in that superb venue, the Ukrainian Cultural Center. And thanks to Rhonda and Jim uh, for their work and to everybody at UMP uh, for producing such a stunning book. I'm a historian of Rome, the very early Roman Republic, seventh century to second century BCE, a period almost entirely reliant on much later historiography for its narrative and a prejudiced and partial narrative is what you get from when there are no contemporary records. So it was a real treat for me, uh, and a new experience to work on a topic where actual contemporary documents were to hand. These were the letters and diaries of my father, a German political refugee who fled to England and was then interned in Canada and his wife-to-be, my English mother. Hoarders, they and we all <laughs> were and are, keeping practically every scrap of paper with writing or print on it. It was because those notebooks and letters were all kept that I had any material beyond the handful of oral stories, carefully edited stories, uh, that, were, that were told to me. So my plea is for archives, people, families, to keep these things, not to throw them away, and to house them uh, in, in some suitable location, be that a, a museum, a library, uh, a, a cultural center maybe. Uh, and of course, nowadays, with all the enormous resources of the, of the World Wide Web, to consider putting them online, perhaps, in the, in, in the public domain. It would be a great shame if many other uh, sources of, of uh, uh, interest and information for future generations of historians were lost. We don't want this period to become the 7th century BCE of Rome. Thank you. Thanks, Clements. We're so glad that you could speak tonight and uh, that you could be here to join us. Also joining us is Ed Casey, and he's going to speak uh, next, another of our contributors. Ariel, can we get him on? Ed, I've, I've given you permission to speak. You just have to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. I just want to thank uh, Rhonda and James for a wonderful book. We keep them stacked at our uh, museum. I just want to share a quick story with happened this summer. Um, in May, I received an email from Germany from a, the daughter of a former prisoner. And she was getting old and she wanted to, sh to um, preserve her uh, artifacts. The long and short of it, she's been sending artifacts since May until last week to us, over 70 artifacts. Her father was in prison in 1940. He was a merchant marine. He spent six years in prison here in Canada. Some of the artifacts just run them down quickly. Woven belts, wood carvings, knives made from bones, shirt with a red circle, hat. He was married by proxy in 43 at the Fredericton internment camp in New Brunswick. So we have the paperwork there, artwork, paintings and cartoons, photos, and the name tag, not the name tag, the number tag that you wear around your neck. So when they call in roll call, they just call the number, not your name. But I just thought I'd wanna share that with you. Again, congratulations to both of you and all the contributors. Great book, and we share it. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so we're just waiting to get some some questions in the Q and A. I know you're everyone's sort of processing everything they heard. Um, which was amazing. So if you have any questions, please add them in the Q&A below. Um, but I have a question for Rhonda and James. Um, so you worked with senior scholars and community members and junior scholars and activists. Um, and not, so not everybody will know what it's like and the labor of putting together an anthology. Like what was it like for you to work on this and how much how much of your time did it actually take and i think it's useful for people to know about the process of anthologies and how you put them together want to go first jim <laughs> um okay sure uh, you know it's uh there's no question that it's it's a very lengthy process and this was somewhat different ron and i have worked together before and actually are working together again uh, with another colleague, Jim Naylor, we're working on yet another collection, uh, this time on the uh, coming out of the Winnipeg 1919 General Strikes Conference. Um, but this project is unlike 
really anything we've ever taken on before because the way we conceived of it, bringing in together people from so many different backgrounds and not wanting it to be just, I said, it sounds awful, but not wanting it to be an entirely traditional academic work, something that would leave space for the, for the memories of those who were affected by this, who are not necessarily scholars. And it, it raised some interesting questions uh, about how you help to edit the work of people who, who are giving you their, their lives, their memories. And they're not, they're not the way academics are in the sense that we're so used to peer review and edit and edit and edit. Uh, and so you, you just have to develop a very different sort of hand. And it was, a, it was an interesting challenge. And I think Rhonda, um, please jump in, uh, that it was one of the more difficult projects that I think in some ways I've ever been involved with, but also probably one of the most satisfying. Um, I can't tell you how many times I went back in my mind to the experience of the workshop itself and how that motivated me to keep going with this project and to sometimes put aside some of the other research that, you know, my research, right, that I, and put that aside to work on this. And I, I think Rhonda, you had similar experiences. Yeah, I, I think that um, it was a, a challenging project. It was very different than the, the last book project that we had worked on um, before this on Ukrainians, uh, reimagining Ukrainian Canadians. And uh, partly because I think it went through a different process. That was one where we leveraged our networks and just asked people if they would contribute an article to a collection. And uh, with this one, we decided to go a different route and have the conference. Uh, thinking that that would make it easier <laughs> than the, the other experience. And um, I would say it just made it different. Uh, in some ways, I would say it made it a lot more gratifying because we really uh, were able to get to know uh, our contributors and uh, get, a, get a really good sense of the kind of work that they're doing and get a real sense of uh, how, um, well, just the emotion and, and the meaning involved in doing this kind of work when you're talking about um, folks with experiential knowledge who've lived these experiences that, that you know, you as a scholar are often used to um, working on topics where you're not encountering uh, folks who, who lived through it or experienced it in some very direct or personal way. And so uh, it was really exciting to be able to work with a variety of material and a variety of perspectives that people brought to this project. Um, and it was a lot of work. I mean, for this book project, I had a, a little kid <laughs> around and that was a different experience. So he's, he's really grown up with this book. Um, I think he was two or three years old when uh, we had the workshop and uh, he's come along with that. He's now eight. So uh, that was, yeah, quite different than being a, a younger scholar editing our first book. Uh, but overall, it's a great process. I think it's um, a really wonderful way to do scholarship because it's done in collaboration with some great people and there's so many good ideas that, that come to the table with that and so much enthusiasm that really helps sustain you, especially when uh, you're heading through some of the more tedious parts of the editing process, like uh, copy editing and line editing and fixing footnotes and, and collecting like contracts from everyone collecting contracts bills from everyone. to everyone and telling them that they have to get their thing in for the deadline absolutely but you know we had a really good bunch folks were, were diligent they did their work uh and were really amenable to our editorial pushes on things so we appreciate it uh ariel we have a, a hand up uh from myron milmerick who's another of our contributors will we be able to give myron the floor for a oh yes I'm turning Myron on officially. Oh, that sounded bad. <laughs> oh my. Myron, can you unmute yourself? This is a very different kind of event all of a sudden. So, okay, I, am I on? Yes, you are. are. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Rhonda, especially for uh, her role in putting this book together, but also for uh, acquiring the Prokopchuk family papers uh, when she was working at the Museum of History, the Canadian Museum of History, because I retired just prior to that time and uh, I volunteered to organize that collection. 
And uh, as a result, I've been volunteering there for quite a few years. But I also like to thank uh, uh, Larissa Stavroff, who I understand was also part of the acquisition process. And uh, it's a, a very good collection. I strongly recommend people come and look at it. Uh, Mary Prokop, after this whole internment experience, uh, was very much involved in the Association of the United Ukrainian Canadians. And she was also involved in the women's movement. And she was uh, an active member of the Canadian Peace Congress. So uh, for people interested in these topics, uh, you know, uh, they, they should make a, an effort to come and look at this material. Unfortunately, because of the present conditions, uh, the museum is closed and including the archives. But I guess once things open up, uh, uh, I'd like, I strongly recommend people to come and uh, researchers to come to Ottawa and, and look at it. I understand that uh, Cassandra had access to this uh, material and uh, hopefully she would uh, benefit from it. So I would like to more or less end on that. I'd like to again, thank uh, uh, Jim for his involvement in this. And he's been involved in a number of other projects that I was uh, involved with also. So uh, th this uh, cooperation is very useful to me and, uh, and I'm happy with it. So thank you very much. Ariel, I think you're muted. You're still muted. You're still muted, Ariel. Oh my goodness, that is an <laughs> amateur move. All right. So um, next, um, thank you for that. Um, we have a nice, we have a handful of questions in the Q and A. Some great stuff there. I'm going to ask Nancy Yanovicek to uh, ask her question out loud. Just give me a second to get to her. All right, Nancy, if you can unmute yourself. Okay, hi, congratulations to uh, Jim and Rhonda. Um, and just inspired by the talk about Wildcrats, I also wanna acknowledge and uh, uh, give a shout out to all of the very brave uh, members of AUPE who are wildcatting in uh, Calgary today, uh, many of whom are racialized uh, women who are extremely vulnerable workers. So my question to you is um, to speak more about um, the definition of internment, right? Jim, you talked about this a little bit uh, in your introduction about how the two of you very, very deliberately rethought the definition of internment in a way that might ruffle some feathers um, and I'm also um, thinking about how uh, Franca in her reflections also talked about how this was a unique event because it brought together people at various stages of career, especially emerging scholars who might challenge those entrenched ideas in the historiography, but also activists, right? And um, uh, eyewitnesses. So could you speak to how these kinds of workshops that bring together um, all of these different people from diff with different perspectives inspire historians working in academe to question and challenge ideas that are entrenched in the historiography. May I take the, the opening part of that? Um, okay, I, I actually, uh, it's sort of interesting. One of, the, one of the bizarre things about having a book published at the beginning of a pandemic is you actually launch it after it's been out for several months. So there are actually some reviews that have already been done. And uh, one particular review uh, was, uh, was, was published by one of Canada's most famous authors. In fact, he was, uh, or historians, he was recently in one of his latest book blurb described as a national treasure. And uh, he's also a scholar who has written on internment is the only major scholar who has actually defended, or one of the few who's defended the, uh, the evacuation of Japanese Canadians. And he took real exception to the, uh, to the, to the way in which we chose to expand the definition of internment. Um, and so we definitely did ruffle some feathers uh, because uh, we, we knew that we were going beyond the accepted definition. Uh, we very consciously offered a definition of it. I, I remember I wrote that section in the intro and made sure I provided a dictionary definition of it. <coughs> but then we wanted to go beyond because we saw so many things that were technically not internment. You know, if you look at it, the number of Japanese Canadians who were in quote unquote internment camps was 700 and I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's in the mid 700s. But there were over 20,000 
Japanese Canadians who were forced to evacuate, who were forced to leave, and ended up in work camps, ended up on sugar beet farms. And so it was really important to us because this was internment by other means, as far as we could understand the term. And interestingly enough, uh, I was almost tempted to respond to the, uh, to the review on the online section, but then I noticed that two readers had already done that and made the exact point that, well, this is just nitpicky, you know, to, to say that internment is only this definition of it. We wanted to broaden it out. And then to go back to the, to the second part of the question, and I'll turn it over to someone else at this point, the workshop, reinforced to me how important it was to have a broader understanding of what internment meant, of the impact that this would have on generations. It, it, you know, I'm a scholar and, and so I've thought about some of these things, but until you hear people who have the lived experience, who have, whose parents have been taken away from them, it was fascinating to me to listen to some of these older Japanese Canadians who had experienced internment as a child. And for some of them, they're going, well, you know, it wasn't too bad for us, it was terrible for our parents. And then to realize the long-term impact on these folks. And so at that point, I'll turn it over to Rhonda. Uh, oh, um, oh, actually, oh, um, Franco wants to speak to this and Mike does too. Sure. Um, so what I'm I was actually going to take... suggest that, okay. so we turn it over. Okay. That, yeah, thank you. I thought since Nancy named me that I, I should also <laughs> respond. And I don't know why we're not naming Jack Granitstein. That was, uh, that's the author to whom you refer and was once a, a supportive professor of mine, though I disagree with a lot of what Jack has to say. Um, and I do think that this actually offers a really good example of it because if, if you know, Jim talked about it in, in, in certain ways, and I think if I were to take the point from the from, from uh, you know, memory studies and memory history and trauma, which Jim also talked about, um, that you know, what, what's so clear you know, when, when, when you look at it from that perspective is that internment is this larger thing, right? This larger thing that crosses you know, uh, uh, absolutely you know, clearly bounded categories. And one of the things that the woman you know, who wrote to me, uh, who was very articulate, um, one of the things she, she talked about was, was um, the soundtracks of her life. You know, that these memories are the soundtracks of her life and what she, what she lived with was constant stories, constant worries, constant wondering about how others were seeing them, you know, how, how things were going, were they gonna come home? And that that has defined her so much. Um, and, she, and she was a granddaughter of, um, uh, of an internee. And so the impact of internment more broadly is, is so important. People's stories of internment maybe are the point from which we should begin. Although I know we have to understand, you know, governmentality and, and the ways in which internment was defined, you know, by those in authority. Um, but I think it, it's, you know, it was so much bigger than that. All right, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, I too read the, the review by, by, by Jack and, um, and I mean, I just want to take like a minor, very technocratic point in which he says that, you know, um, we, we talk about Japanese internment as if it's internment, but actually only, you know, a certain number of people are interned. But just again, very technocratic, um, very petty point. If you check footnote five of my article, um, I go over that extensively about the difference between Japanese evacuees who are evacuated basically under like, again, legality matters and liberalism, but they evacuated them basically under like psychiatric health orders. That's how they finangled it through the legalistic uh, frame. But of course, 800 Japanese people were in turn, mostly for labor agitation and for resisting internment. Um, but that discrepancy between the people who are subject to the removal operations and the people who are subject to uh, Japanese uh, Canadians who are subject to actual legal internment um, is very clearly articulated. Um, but again, you know, in, in the footnotes, perhaps not uh, prominently displayed in the narrative. Um, so, you know, as we, uh, if we do choose to respond to that, um, you know, which I may or may not have been typing away on, um, you know, that's something we might want to draw attention to. Yeah, so that's it for me. All right, um, our next question comes from um, Cam Teo. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, and he 
uh, is going to come on uh, on and speak his question as well. So I'm Cam, you just need to hit the unmute button, which is at the bottom of your screen, I believe. Just found it. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> now, if I can just remember the question that I asked. OK. Um, this conference that I also attended five years ago also uh, allowed non-activists and scholars to take part in the conference. Uh, did these attendees add anything substantive to the conference or to the scholarship that was compiled by U of M Press? Rhonda and Jim? I think that um, for me as an editor of the collection and an organizer of the conference, um, it was especially gratifying to see the, the interest extend in the subject matter in the conference beyond uh, those folks who were giving papers or had some specific scholarly interest in uh, the subject of internment. Um, and I think that part of Part of what that offered to me as, as someone working on the book um, following the conference was uh, a reminder that this, this is a bigger issue. It's still a contemporary issue. It's one that even though um, many of the episodes we're, we're talking about in the book or that our, our contributors are talking about happened in the past, in the very distant past, that the implications uh, of those choices by authorities and the choices that, that those were affected by those authorities' choices made uh, had long-term ramifications, intergenerational consequences, and that the relevance of the subject matter extends even beyond the notion of internment to broader conversations around uh, civil liberties and human rights that I don't know that we do a very great job talking about uh, even today in spite of knowing this history. And so I think having those, those other voices that were there at the conference and interested and um, contributing to the Q&A and contributing to those lunchtime chats and those hallway conversations uh, just really underscored uh, what an important and serious and uh, still very much longstanding issue that internment is. Yeah, I would, I would, the only thing I would add to that, um, I know Victor Dobchuk has, has asked a question and he said he, he can't verbalize it uh, because his, his voice is, is gone right now. Uh, but he asked in some ways a, a question that, that pertains to this. He was asking whether or not the things that we talk about in the book really pertains to today's sociopolitical conditions. And I think that the, the presence of people from outside the academic community and from just in, people who are interested and came to the workshop showed us that there is a real hunger for this sort of thing outside of a very narrow band. And it's, it was important, it, I don't wanna speak for Rhonda here, but it, it certainly helped to influence the way I handled material. The, the, the notion that we were not just dealing with some aspects of the past that yes, we needed to address and we shouldn't bury unpleasant history, but that it also is so pertinent to the present that we can see everyday folks running the risks of running afoul of the state because they happen to fit into the wrong categories. Many of the things that, that we looked at are cautionary tales for people today. You know, we, we forget at our peril that Western governments, and I'll include both Canada and the United States in this, because I have a big foot in both countries, um, violate the civil liberties of individuals. And they quite often do it largely on the basis of someone who's racialized, someone who is who doesn't fit in with the, with, with the, the contemporary mindset, that which is the common wisdom. And so I, so I, to make a, sorry, a, a very long answer to a short question. I think that yes, the presence of outside folks, outside of the community, but also people who raised, who forced me to think about things in different ways in a very real and immediate way was very, very important to my process. So I was gonna add to that, uh, what Jim was saying reminded me of an experience that I had of, um, you know, going from the research scholar to putting it on display, right? And doing the exhibit and so forth. A number of years ago, 
uh, at um, the Ontario Workers Arts and Heritage Center, as it was called. Now it's called the Workers Arts and Heritage Center. We did a major um, multiple floor exhibit on Italian workers. And we had various aspects of their lives. But in the basement, we built an internment camp. And we built a cell and, you know, and, and we managed to get from the Italian Canadian community in Hamilton, which did not initially trust us. I mean, they said, oh, that's a left wing group. You know, those are just like the lefties who hang out at that center. Um, but we, you know, we worked on it, we worked with them and we said, you know, we may not agree on all sorts of things, but we would really like to convey your experience. And so eventually these folks, you know, who initially didn't really trust us, lent us incredible things. They lent us the kinds of, you know, items um, uh, that were described earlier, right? The, the, the belts that were made and so on and so forth. But they also lent us the letters that their children and their wives wrote to them. And we had these letters, you know, blown up, right? Brisk, you know, great big posters. And what was so interesting was that as people came out of that basement, they were absolutely in tears. It was just absolute tears, one after another. And it was very interesting to me, you know, as a left-wing feminist academic who sometimes gets into trouble you know, around political debates within the Italian Canadian community, it was so important, you know, and they thanked us, you know, they thanked us for doing it. So the power, the power of museums and the power of public display is really, really something that you know, gets underscored by, you know, the kind of work that the people in the book are doing. I, I would just want to add something I haven't had, I haven't really addressed in, in the other comments is that I am so pleased that we were able to actually have serious contributions from people who are, who are involved in public history people from the museum community, people who are actively involved in bringing this material. You know, we heard from, from both Todd and, and Ed Cassie tonight, uh, but of course we have other contributions. And you know, historians speak sometimes to very, very small crowds. You know, we, we write our, our peer reviewed books that, and articles that you know, 10 other people with PhDs in our field read. Um, meanwhile, public historians are out there and they are touching hundreds, thousands of tens of thousands of people with the interpretations, getting this information across. And it's, it was so important to me that we had an entire section that actually showed this part of this process because the way that we remember commemorate things is of course crucial. It's a point that, that Franca brings up when she talks about memory. And, but the way in which commemoration is carried out and the way we try to forget things that we don't like as part of the nation's history you know, are something, is something that I really, it's one of the, I, I'm proud of, of all of this book, but I'm really pleased that we were able to include this as a, a major component of our work. Ron, did you want to add anything to that? Um, if not, I'll go to the next question. Unmute. Yeah, I think uh, just picking up on what Jim said about the importance of, of public history and uh, how really adamant we were that that needed to be in there. I think hearing about the work uh, that came through in Ed and Todd's article uh, about the New Brunswick Museum, uh, the work that Sharon Riley talked about her, her having done at the Manitoba Museum, Jody Giesbrecht's important essay on the, the very challenging environment of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and, and representing stories of loss and internment uh, in that venue. Uh, it's, it's so important because, as Jim mentioned, the, the audiences that, that those kinds of places reach is so important. And I think it's really frightening, those of us that work in public history, uh, to think about the kind of situation that museums and historic sites are in right now because of this pandemic. I saw an article a couple of months ago that, uh, and this is still fairly early in the pandemic, that suggested something uh, like 30% of museums in the US did not expect to survive the pandemic. And that was, I think back in June that I read that. Um, and that was uh, the sense of if, if this continued on. And so I really, worry about um, the kinds of histories that are you know being preserved because of the care of volunteers and and folks who are uh, maintaining these 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 kinds of artifacts like the the gifts that were made in these internment camps that uh, these folks would have something to send to their kids at christmas 
uh, when they, you know, in the absence of their being able to, to work in a traditional way. And I hope that we don't lose those kinds of spaces. I think it, it underscores the, the importance of public history for the kind of reach it has in getting these issues out. And we really, I don't know, we all need to be worried about our public history spaces right now and figure out uh, important ways that we can continue to support them in, in, in this current pandemic. All right, um, so our next question is from Connie Wawruck Hemet, and she is going to um, again uh, come on and say her her um, question herself. Um, Connie, you just need to go to the bottom and hit the unmute button. There we go. I think I'm un unmuted. Yes. Hello, Jim and Rhonda and Myron and Franca and all my old friends. How wonderful to see you and what an amazing book you brought out. I'm just itching to read it. Uh, I know that it's going to be really interesting. You, uh, you do know, of course, of my particular interest in, in um, the uh, fascist movement of the 30s and, and that it uh, comes from a different uh, direction. Um, but I'm curious as to whether anything, uh, any of the, uh, the researchers in uh, doing their their particular research did come across any of uh, the um, families of uh, the fascist uh, the fascists that were were in turn the the uh, sort of uh, how can I say a non ethnic if you will uh, uh, that is taking it away from the the so called uh, uh, Italian fascists and the German fascists and bringing it back to the, the sort of amorphous mass that made up a small but very active uh, fascist movement uh, in here, here in Winnipeg and certainly in Quebec. And I'm wondering if anybody came across any of the, those families that uh, uh, of, of those, those people that were interned and what their particular experience might have been and what that says for today as we appear to be moving more to the right in, in certain areas of our society. Uh, I was struck today when I saw something on Facebook saying that there are there's an internment camp in Winnipeg for people with COVID-19. Now, of course, this is an absolutely ridiculous statement, but still, it sort of, especially that I was knew that I was going to be listening to you to, tonight, it really struck me as as something interesting. So that's that's a personal personal point of curiosity for me, and I hope you don't mind me asking. But I think uh, I hope that perhaps somebody might be able to tell tell me something. Rhonda or Jim, do you want to take that? Um, well, actually, hey, Connie, uh, long time no see. Um, actually, I can't really think of any of the individual contributions that really address that in, in any sort of depth. Um, Ed and, uh, and, and Todd's essay actually mention uh, some of the Canadian fascist community hood, for example, uh, being at their camp, the, their camp, the one that they studied in New Brunswick briefly. Um, but no, there really was very little. Uh, and I think, I'm not sure that, um, I don't think in this collection, but I, I, I think that there were some comments that Franca has made in the past about some of the interaction between the different groups of fascists when they, when, when they were in camps. But really nothing, Rhonda, can you think of anything that is in our collection that touches on this in particular? No, not beyond what you've already what you've already mentioned. I mean, um, my contribution, which is about um, women leftists during World War II who were um, interned or interned by other means, I suppose, um, because the federal government or, or local authorities, local attorney generals uh, on the prairies found that they could more easily convict women under the Defense of Canada regulations. Uh, and so would often go after them uh, and get court convictions for them, women like Annie Bowler, uh, Florence Theodore, others on the prairies. Um, so women's experience were, were, were very different than uh, what uh, male 
uh, leftists among Ukrainians and uh, others, others on the far left were encountering. And throughout some of that, uh, certainly there's uh, conversations that come out in the literature and the evidence about uh, encountering uh, fascist, pro-fascist, pro-Nazi um, political activists and that, and being really outraged that the police were spending their time, the RCMP, which is not surprising to those of us that do history now, but being really outraged uh, contemporaries that uh, so much attention was being focused on, on the leftists, on the pro-communists, when there were those who were actively out there declaring their support for uh, Hitler and, uh, you know, those, those forces that Canada was uh, fighting against overseas. Um, but in terms of specifics on that in Winnipeg, there wasn't a heck of a lot. Um, probably the, the places where I saw that coming out of the research, and I'm, and I'm working on a much larger project uh, coming out of the research that I did for this article for the book that's um, dealing with an extended family, a uh, leftist family, uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, Jewish uh, intermarried, large extended family, big complicated family, uh, and their internment experiences. And uh, some of the men in that family ended up in camps in, in Petawawa, uh, where those in Eastern Canada, uh, so east of the Ontario border, ended up being interned um, with uh, known fascists, many of those who had been rounded up in uh, Southern Ontario and in Quebec. Um, but that's, that's where it, it sort of stops. There certainly didn't, I didn't find anything in my research that, that was very specific to your particular interest, Connie. Um, okay, so um, we have a question from Les Kojima, who asks, is there one message that you hope readers will take away from the book? Um, go first. Be vigilant. This isn't over. It's ongoing. I mean, there's so many ways that, you know, for various purposes that state authorities still attempt to uh, control people, to intern people. Well, I remember when we were working on this book uh, and Donald Trump, when he was first running for election, came out and said that, yes, maybe we should intern all Muslims. That's, that's a good idea. And so just, just that, that that kind of rhetoric is thrown around so easily and seeing the situation in the US, um, seeing the way that, that Canada, uh, Canadian authorities have handled, um, you know, quote unquote security matters, it's, it's really frightening. And I think that uh, at the time that many of these internment episodes were going on that we talk about in the book, there was um, not a lot of knowledge in, in a broader sense among, um, many folks in Canada that this was even going on. And unless you were a part of those affected communities where you very well knew what was going on, um, it was easy to uh, either ignore it uh, or to uh, go, on, go about your life not even realizing that, that this was going on. And so I think we, we have to think about ways that those things are still occurring today and, and push back, challenge them and do better, do much better. I, I would actually <clears throat> echo much of that. And one of the things that, that, that has, I mean, for me, the bottom line is that civil liberties are always fragile. <clears throat> and I know in my own contribution, uh, to my own chapter in the book, I, I actually make the point that uh, the number of uh, members of the Ukrainian left were uh, only escaped further persecution because the RCMP was so damned incompetent and didn't have the manpower, and I do mean manpower, to go after when they're also so sexist they didn't realize that many of the best organizers in the ukrainian canadian left-wing community were women uh they just just ignore them uh but you know but it's a you can't always count on the incompetence of security agencies and sometimes the incompetence can really really hurt because as some of the contributions to this to this volume show uh you know the word of someone who's got an axe to grind against someone else in the Italian community, for example, ended up someone who definitely wasn't a fascist ending up being interned. Um, we, we have cases like that, but even more to the point, although because of the incredible efforts of people like Art Mickey and others in the Japanese Canadian community, as they were fighting for redress, I wanna stress this, they weren't just fighting for redress for the Japanese Canadian community. They weren't just 
fighting for you know for for a for a payout for a particular group or an apology for a particular group, they wanted to have the sorts of legislation, namely the War Measures Act, things that were used to actively suppress, evacuate, and intern people and take away their civil liberties and their civil rights. They wanted that changed. They wanted that done away with. And the War Measures Act has been scrapped. The problem is that governments can always figure out ways to get around things in the same way that when the War Measures Act came out of effect at the close of the Great War, the government found ways of making those old wartime powers when everything is, is possible. Uh, they put it into new forms of legislation and they were able to continue to harass people who didn't fit into mainstream society. And we're seeing similar things being done on throughout the Western world. Governments can find ways to take away people's rights and liberties and their freedoms of expression and also their freedom to be who and what they are. It's not just about ideology. So the message I want people to take away is that we have to be very, very vigilant in our protection of civil liberties at all times. I'm sorry, sound American, my God. All right. Um, well, we are, um, it feels like that that is a perfect place to end uh, this event. Um, I know there are, there's a question we didn't get to, but it feels like um, this is the best place to go, to leave us to something to think on. There will always be more questions. There will always be more that could have been added for the next anthology. But um, I'd like to thank everyone so much for joining us um, for the launch of Civilian Internment in Canada. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I'd like to thank all the contributors that joined us on camera and off. And I'd like to thank everyone to contributing to such a, a lovely discussion. Um, all right, so let's get everyone that is in the room on camera. We'll all wave goodbye. We'll, we'll um, smile, you know, smile big. Um, and, uh, and then we'll go. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Stay, stay safe. Stay safe. Bye. Yeah. Oh, bye -bye. yes, please stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. All right. This is you're ending with me, and in two seconds, I'm going to turn the event off. But um, please check out the book on our website. That's my cue. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>